Hi everyone. Welcome to the Northern Institute and our People Policy Place seminar series for 2021. Today we have uh, Angela Sheedy joining us uh, in a moment, but before we start, I would like to acknowledge that uh, this seminar is being held on the traditional lands of the Larrakia people, and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and future. If you could just remember that um, any questions to Angela should go in the Q&A section, which you can find at the bottom or top of your screen. We won't be taking questions in the chat um, and we'll remind you of that at the end. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Angela and ask her to start the seminar. Thanks, Angela. Great. Thanks so much, Katrina. And thanks for the acknowledgement of country. And um, it's great to be here with Northern Institute. I'm just going to get my presentation on so we can start moving through. Right, so my presentation to you today is specific to the Northern Territory and I'm presenting as the Northern Territory Emergency Response Workforce Educator for the Department of Health. This has kept me very busy educating across different areas around the Northern Territory with a focus on ensuring we have a COVID safe workforce working in our emergency response workforce. Um, this means I've worked with people such as the Australian Defence Force, I've worked with government non-health and health people um, and we've brought so many different people into our emergency response workforce it's just been amazing. So this has been you know school leavers, um, people who had their job displaced by COVID um, and so on. So it's been a very vast array and a great opportunity to actually be working with this group. Um, and I mean, I guess we can also say that NT has been one of the safest places in the world today, certainly in Australia as well. Um, and that isn't all down to chance. Um, you know, there has been a really informed and a highly reactive response going on in the background to ensure that uh, the NT community is kept safe. So I'm going to provide a brief overview of the different areas um, or departments, if you like, that have been making up some of that response. Um, tell you a little bit about what each of these spaces are doing um, and then, of course, go on to talk about some of our, our challenges that we're still facing here in the NT. Um, after that, I'd be very happy to answer any questions. So do we have COVID in the NT? Well, yes, we do. <laughs> okay. And we've got about, uh, I think that yesterday it was two cases. I'm not quite sure if, it's, if we're still at two cases. Um, and of course, they are in our international quarantine facility at the moment. But um, we do have COVID in the NT and community complacencies, you know, I guess been one of the biggest concerns for us because although we've been safe to date and we have had over, you know, 100 cases of COVID in the NT to date, um, there is always that chance that we could have active COVID within our community at any point. So we need to think about these cases that we have had come through. They've been through our airports, through our shipping ports. They've been transferred between facilities up to our COVID um, quarantine areas. Um, they've been in our hospitals. And of course, we've had all of their specimens go through our pathology departments. So at no time in any of those processes here in the NT have we had a breach or have we had a community transmission occur. So as um, we were seeing in the, in the ABC report this morning, a case of luck, but also a case of like a highly, um, a highly trained and highly efficient um, set of, of um, departments, organisations and strategies going on there in the background. But what we do need to remember is that, you know, these people who are working in these areas, they don't go into quarantine themselves. Um, you know, they've got families, they're taking their kids to school, they're going out and so forth. So there's always that real risk that COVID may be in our, um, circulating within our community somewhere and we're not aware of it. We also have to remember that our borders are open to every other part of Australia at the moment as well and that they, in their areas, have people in quarantine as well. So we just, I guess, you know, reiterating those standard precautions that we are trying to make sure everyone remembers around, you know, hand hygiene, social and physical distancing and staying at home if you're not well. So our teams basically um, have been guided by our Chief Health Officer's directions and our Hazard Management Authority and Emergency Operations Centre. Um, and they've been, I guess, you know, forming a lot of the backbone of our response to the Northern Territory. 
like every other part in Australia, um, our Chief Health Officer's directions, or show directions as we call them, are law. And so they provide us a great set of guidance that we're able to then enforce to help keep our communities safe. <clears throat> And of course, we've also had the um, National Critical Care and Trauma Response Centre working in the background with us at the very beginning. And this has been a great advantage for us, particularly in setting things up like our quarantine facility. For those of you who weren't aware, the National Critical Care Trauma Response Team, or OSMAT team, are the team that Australia sends out for other disasters or um, pandemics or epidemics or so forth going on around the place. Um, so they, for example, would be sent out to respond to things like the earthquake in Christchurch, or um, this time last year we had a large measles outbreak in the Pacific Islands. So that's the Team Australia sends. And so they bring real, real world experience with them to help us set up things like um, our quarantine centres here in the Northern Territory. Um, and they have that experience in working in a public health emergency situation. So public health emergency situations, they're a little bit different to other types of disasters because within these types of circumstances, we're quite willing to sacrifice the rights of the individual, if you like, to protect the greater community. So that's where we see things that our CHO directions will come across with our, our quarantine movements. So, for example, people who were coming into the Northern Territory from a declared COVID hotspot were required to go into quarantine for 14 days. Not great for the individual, but it does mean that it is protecting our community. Um, it would then go on to say that people within that quarantine facility from the hotspot would need to have a COVID swab within 24 hours of arrival and then again within 10 days. Okay, so they can refuse to have that COVID swab done, but under the CHO directions, that means then that they would have to stay another 10 days in quarantine. So that's a total of 24 days at their expense in Howard Springs quarantine. So, so far everyone's been very compliant around that and there hasn't been too many issues. But um, we can see that, you know, there's a lot of challenges for us um, or for these teams setting up these guidelines for us to follow within our various teams. And I'll outline those teams to you coming up um, because our COVID response needs to accommodate our very multicultural population. We have our very remote communities um, and of course our environmental challenges. And so we need to be aware enough that we might have to be running out of COVID response to a remote community when we've got a tropical cyclone threat going, we might have flooding, we might not be able to even access some of the communities by road. And of course, that's here in the top end. Within Central Australia, we've got our desert region. So again, very environmentally challenging to be working within those areas if we did need to respond to a COVID outbreak in one of those communities there. So what I'll do now, is move on and I'm going to spend the, the main part of this um, discussion basically around those areas and teams that are working in the background to, to keep us safe here in the NT. So I'm going to start off with the CDC. Now the Centers for Disease Control have always been busy here in the Northern Territory. They're basically working, have always been working in the background with the Sexual Health and Bloodborne Virus Unit and our TV clinics. So, for example, if you weren't aware that we do have a bit of a syphilis outbreak here in the Northern Territory at the moment, not great, but you know, the CDC would be working in that area, basically with things like contact tracing and getting health messages out um, to keep communities safe and well. So we've already, so we've basically added COVID to their all very, already very busy workload, if you like. So our CDC oversee things like our pandemic clinic and our drive-through screening clinic. And this is where people can go and get swabbed for COVID. Just um, heads up that those clinics are by appointment only. And that's because we can at any time have a very large number of people that we have to navigate through those um, particular areas. Um, particularly if we do, again, you know, call something like a hotspot, we might already have a number of people who have arrived in the Northern Territory from that hotspot um, who would then be requested to go and get a COVID swab. And so we've got a very comprehensive system in the background navigating all of those phone calls coming through and making sure that we've got enough staff 
staff on board within those clinics to manage that um, sudden, which can be a sudden surplus in, in the amount of swabs needing to be um, done. So they're also working in the background. Um, we would have been well aware of uh, different places in Melbourne and Sydney where they've had to set up a lot of swabbing stations in reaction to different COVID outbreaks in their community. Um, and so our CDC team have also been working on that to make sure that we've got space um, to be able to, to run these types of things, the resources and the staff ready to go. Uh, so, so big jobs kind of going on just in the background there that um, people aren't aware of, but of course, you know, we, we need to be prepared and, and, they, and they are prepared. Um, they also do a lot of our contact tracing and that they've trained now over, I think around 300 people plus in contact tracing more specific for COVID response. Um, contact tracing is a really complex part of the pandemic to manage. It is really time consuming. Um, and I guess, you know, if we could imagine that I was presenting to you today in a, in a room, and so we're all sharing a room together. Um, I'd been unwell for a couple of days, let's say, and so I finish up my presentation and think I'll, I'll take myself off to the doctor and get recommended for a swab. My swab might come back positive tomorrow, and that would mean that every single one of you who were in that room with me would then be required, you'd be contacted by the CDC and be required to go into isolation. Okay, um, and then it would cascade from there. They'd need to go back to those first days when I was feeling unwell, um, look at where I've been, and I've been with, um, and decide whether they need to be contacted, are they a close contact, and so forth. And they would need to go into quarantine as well, sorry, isolation as well, and get swabbed. And they'd need to be in isolation for 14 days. If they then tested positive, they would need to get in contact with their close contacts, and so on and so on. Um, contact tracing can provide uh, quite a lot of ethical considerations for us to, to ponder as well. Um, that can certainly be seen when I was watching um, the national news and there was the security guard in the last Melbourne outbreak. And she unfortunately was acquired um, COVID as part of her, her job as security guard in the quarantine facility there um, and had been in the community for some time, a few days. And of course, they needed to alert the community to um, where this person had been. Um, so all of her daily um, travels that were significant were put on the news. And so this meant we all found out that, you know, she went to the coffee shop, then she went to Dan Murphy, and then she went to another coffee shop, and then she went to Dan Murphy's. <laughs> and I just thought, oh, gosh, you know, that's quite devastating for that individual. But it does bring us back to that, that point, you know, at the beginning when we're looking at these type of public health emergencies, you know, we kind of sacrifice the rights of the individual because it's the only way we can get the messaging out to the community to keep them safe. So, um, yes, just something for us to think about there. Of course, you know, with contact tracing, there have been other dilemmas that we've seen. Um, we had one where a truck driver had... Um, uh, been out in, in um, Shepparton, hadn't been honest about where he'd been. Consequently, there was an unknown case turn up in Shepparton and it took a while for them to be able to actually assert and it had come from this one, one person. And because that was um, work that he didn't want to disclose at that time, he hadn't disclosed it to, to, the, um, to the contact tracing team. So very, as I said, a very interesting area to be working around um, if it has to play out. So the CDC also run one of our main phone lines um, and that again, you know, provides a very large logistical challenge within a, a pandemic because we can't have people sitting on a phone line doing nothing and there'll be quite often quite big lulls, particularly at times like this where everything seems to be, dare I say it, touch wood, going fairly smoothly. <laughs> um, and so we don't need a lot of people within the phone line there. But again, if we have a hotspot declared, um, the phone lines use goes up very, very high. And so that means we've got to have spaces with equipment, you know, resources and people ready to call in and hit those phone lines and understand how to use the system, understand the latest um, Chief Health Officer's directions that might be directing um, the information they're giving and so forth. So our Public Health Directorate, I'll move on to there. They, um, they're doing quite a lot in the background, particularly around messaging and so forth and, and um, ensuring that our businesses and, and um, 
other organisations, non-government organisations and so forth have that support that they need to be COVID safe. And so they provide us with our public health officers and our compliance officers. So our public health officers are very much um, working with businesses to you know, help them develop their COVID management plans to ensure they're running uh, their business in a COVID safe way. I actually spoke to them and said, what's some of the biggest challenges that you come across, you know, or what space you have to give a bit of information? Um, and they said tea towels, which, which at first I was like, what? But then of course it makes complete sense, doesn't it? You know, that they're going into these shared office spaces or any shared space, um, and that you might have a, a, a office area with around 20 people all using the same kitchen and they're all using a tea towel, which then becomes a source of transmission. Um, and so it's and not just for COVID either, you know, if we really think about it. So I guess one of my take home messages to you from the um, public health officers would be, yeah, don't have tea towels in your shared kitchens, OK? <laughs> Um, they also work with our compliance officers and they're out there, you know, we still have certain people who get what we call exemptions and are able to quarantine within hotel facilities and so forth. Um, and so the compliance officers are out there making sure that they are doing what they should be and staying within, staying in isolation and not leaving that facility or that area at all. They work alongside the police as necessary. Um, and that means that if we were alerted to someone who potentially had left uh, one of the areas that they were supposed to be isolated in, um, they could even go into, say, Coles or somewhere and, and request to have a look at the security footage there um, so they can see, you know, if they can locate that person. Um, and, of course, then they would be fined. Um, but it's, you know, it is a serious offence um, and the fine has gone right up now. I believe it's up around the $5,000 now just to make sure people understand, you know, it's, it's serious. You need to be stayed put if that's what you've been ordered to do. So the Emergency Response Workforce Hub is where my position sits as the educator and there's three educators working there at the moment. We have one who's working specifically with the, the CDC to do training, um, another who's working with our aged care workforce to, to look at um, developing an um, education package to, to um, prepare a surge response for the aged care areas. Um, and myself, who kind of works across um, other areas of the emergency response workforce. So, for example, plus the border restrictions team um, with our poets that I'm going to outline to you and so on. Um, and I'm also at the moment delivering a series of education sessions across the NT to Northern Territory government uh, non-health organisations. In saying that, though, we are open to other organisations if they contact us. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're supportive and if people want COVID um, education and support, we'll see what we can do to make sure we deliver that. But the ERW Hub, their main job is to look at our workforce and basically um, employ and deploy. So they are looking at where staff needs are. Um, they help with all of our surge workforce um, planning and they also run through a lot of other um, emergency response planning. So, for example, if we had a uh, positive case in one of our renal clinics and we lose our renal um, staff, um, how are we going to mitigate that situation? People need renal dialysis to be able to survive. We, it's not a service we can just close. So quite a busy little team in the background there. Um, I'll move on now to our border restrictions team. They, again, are, are one of our larger teams and they have a very comprehensive, I mean, obviously I'm giving you a very surface picture of what each area is doing. And so again, border restrictions have quite a comprehensive role within in their particular team. They um, have various reaches of their team. Based, some are based at the airport, screening flights as they come through, for example, and ensuring everyone fills out a border arrival form. Um, and, of course, we then got our database management who are keeping all of that up to date for us. So that means that here in the NT, everyone is required to fill out a border arrival form when they come into the Northern Territory. And that allows us to be able to 
um, register and monitor every single person who's coming into the NT. So if we did have a hotspot called in Adelaide, say, we have actually can pull up on our database everyone who's come from Adelaide um, and from that specific region, and then we could be reaching out them to them to ask them to perhaps um, isolate and get a swab done and so forth. Um, they basically also run one of our main phone lines. So again, you know, we've got that surge response that we have to manage for their team in the background there um, with making sure that we've got space, we've got resources and we've got people to come in and man those phone lines if required there. Um, they, so the border restrictions team are sort of looking at um, the greater part of people coming, any of that movement in and out of the Northern Territory. Um, so a very, very important team for us, particularly when we do have hot spots declared. Um, and we still need to have access to essential service provision and goods. Um, so we still need to perhaps get trucks in from that particular area, bringing food and so forth. And how do we do that safely? So. I'll move on now to our infection control team and they're our COVID resource nurses primarily as well. Um, these guys are really important, okay? They, they're protecting our most vulnerable territorians, if you like. So they've set up what we call the point of entry team. They work to be screening everybody who's coming in to any of our top end health services. So anyone using those clinical um, or health service provisions, whether they be a worker or whether they be um, a visitor or, or a client. Um, so everybody coming in is screened for signs and symptoms or any epidemiological criteria that may put them at risk for COVID. And of course, if they are positive to any of those things, they're not permitted to have um, entry within the facility. Um, so it, as I said, it means that we're keeping those people, particularly in our hospital, where if people are inpatients in hospital, they have very little control of protecting themselves from disease transmission when they're there. So you know, it means that we, by putting these team members at the very front of the facility, we're doing everything we can to make sure that that COVID doesn't enter into those premises and put them at, at higher risk as well. Of course, our infection control team are working very hard in the background, making sure that they were most up to date with different um, trends in disease transmission and news and PPE and all of those really important foundational aspects of COVID that um, we need to feed through to all of our teams there. So our quarantine facilities, well, I think that would just be a whole seminar by itself, to be honest. <laughs> um, we have obviously got two quarantine, main quarantine facilities going here. Um, our main site in the Northern Territories, you know, for out at Howard Springs quarantine facility. So we have the side that's managed by the Northern Territory Government um, and we have the side that's that's managed by the Federal Government and that's the Northern Territory Centre for Resilience. Um, I guess what you'd need to remember is that our quarantine facilities are considered healthy places. So we do have 24-7 health staff available there, but we are anticipating that people coming into these facilities that, you know, uh, that we're not going to be facing dire health problems and so forth. Um, we also need to make sure we've got a very um, strategic public health approach to how these are managed. So if anyone's been out there and, and this, the image that you've got on your screen here with a stop donning required, that's um, actually taken out at Howard Springs at one of our stations there. <laughs> um, but it means that, you know, as people come in, we attempt to basically put men travelling alone in one section, families and women, um, families and couples in another section and women travelling alone in another section there. Um, and we will move around the facility. So if we had someone arriving um, today, for example, from a hotspot, we're not going to put them right next to someone who's been there for 10 days, okay, because we want to minimise any risk of transmission. So they'll need to go into a separate area within the quarantine facility. Now, when it was used as the, um, the workers' place to stay for INPEX, this, this facility could take around 3,000 people. So for us using it in um, as a COVID response quarantine centre, We'd always sit around a thousand people because then that gives us the ability to move people around that facility and keep people safe. So it's um, very differently run on both sides as well. Within the international side, there is a lot less contact with the people who are in that quarantine facility. So, for example, when they come in, they get an iPad 
um, an iPhone and a wearable device. And so they wear that device on their arm here and that actually wi fis back information around their vital signs as in their temperature and so forth. So it stops a lot of that health checking needing to go on there. They have one meal delivery a day as well, for example. So they'll have their meal delivered, a hot meal delivered at night with their breakfast and lunch for the next day. In the Northern Territory side, we do it a little bit different. They generally get two meals delivered every day. And each day our health team will go fully donned, of course, in PPE, um, go and, and knock on doors and, and make sure that um, people are okay and do COVID checks that way. So I'll keep moving on here. So National Critical Care and Trauma Response Team, I've already outlined who they are for you there. Um, they have been overseeing our rapid response teams as well. And those rapid response teams, they've done training all over the Northern Territory to ensure that if we did have a response within one of our remote Indigenous communities, that we've got a team that's been trained to go into that community and keep that community safe. Um, and one of their big focuses, of course, has been making sure that we try and include, or they try and include, um, as many members from the community um, as possible, so that when, if and when we had to turn up in our full PPE and so forth, the community is going to be understanding of of what needs to be done um, and not worried about the fact that they're going to see people walking around in masks and so forth, um, you know, and, and requesting for people to have swabs and that done. It's been a massive job and, um, and quite ongoing. So they, for us, if we did have a, um, a community acquired COVID, it would need to be in one case, um, and it would need to be uh, verified by a laboratory test, pathology test. Um, and as soon as that's um, verified, then that rapid response team would, would kick in. Um, and so they would go out to that community and assess the needs of the community, um, and then what teams we would need to bring in to, to actually see um, what the risk is at that, to that community from, um, from COVID. So there are other teams here that I haven't put down. Um, for example, I said we've got an uh, aged care team working in the background where we're sort of looking at surge workforce response and so forth if required. Um, and of course, we've got our VAX team who are, are very busy at the moment. Um, and, and they've got a lot of their own challenges. If you've been keeping up with the, the vaccination, it's quite a, a complicated and, and challenging process in that, you know, each, each vial is contains six doses. Um, and of course, they need to be kept at a very low temperature. So once that vial is defrosted and for use, it can't be refrozen, it needs to be used. So they are having to do a lot of logistical um, planning to make sure that they've got the right number of doses defrosting each day. They've got the people coming through to get them um, and that there's no wastage of that very precious resource for us. <laughs> So I think I've given you a fairly brief, a good, a brief but good, I hope, overview of, of some of the different teams that are working there. So what I'll move on now is to our challenges and plans. And um, well, there's many, isn't there? So I guess community complacency is that big one. As I said at the very beginning, you know, we we need to understand that there's always that risk that COVID could be silently moving in our community at this very moment and we just don't know about it. So really reinforcing those um, standard practices around keeping ourselves and our um, businesses and, and our workplaces and our families COVID safe, uh, you know, with hand hygiene, not going to work if you're unwell, and that social distancing and so forth. Um, we certainly, as I said, you know, we know that we've been really lucky here in the NT and I really hope we still, we, we maintain that. And, um, but we just also want to make sure that our community doesn't um, let their guard down too much. We've also got a lot of challenges with our vulnerable populations. They've always been challenging um, for us to, to be able to manage. Like we, we have to be aware that, you know, um, we've got people who are in our prison systems, who are in our hospitals, who are in our aged care facilities. Um, and they're very vulnerable to COVID transmission because as I said, they, they have very limited ability to stop transmission. If we had someone who was unwell with COVID go within a, facility, a prison facility, for example, the prisoners there are gonna have very little opportunity to defend themselves against that, that COVID entering. Um, of course, we've got our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander populations and our elderly and so forth as well. 
a lot of, we obviously haven't had a, a COVID outbreak in, within an Aboriginal community up here. Um, so a lot of the statistics that we're looking at with COVID and identifying our vulnerable populations and at-risk populations are based on statistics that we can look at where the influenza virus has been most detrimental. And so these are the groups that we see that have higher levels of hospitalisation, higher levels of mortality um, and longer recovery rates and so forth. And so we can safely say then that for us with these groups, um, that that would be the same with, with COVID-19. So they really, I guess, you know, are always on our plans to make sure that as we're moving forward, that uh, we, we really are keeping in mind our vulnerable groups there. Vaccine hesitancy as, um, you know, in 2019, Pre-COVID, uh, vaccine hesitancy was one of the greatest challenges to world health anyway, as cited by the World Health Organization. Um, and I guess that doesn't, uh, you know, we're still seeing a lot of it today with the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, personally, you know, this is a virus that we have no cure for and that we don't really have an effective treatment for. So I am all in for, you know, putting my sleeve up and getting that vaccination. I think we should be doing everything we can to, to be protecting ourselves and our community. Oh, correct and timely messaging. Um, well, the World Health Organization actually described with the messaging and so forth that's gone out with COVID as an infodemic, <laughs> which I think is a great word, infodemic. So, which is that, fast traveling, rapid spread of information, both accurate and non-accurate. Um, and, you know, that was really important for us here in the Northern Territory and still is to make sure that the messaging that we have going out is accurate, that we're staying up to date. Um, at the moment, of course, we're seeing that we're getting a bit of a swing in the transmission information around COVID where we've been very focused on droplet transmission. And now we're moving to a much higher alertness and awareness of this airborne abilities of transmission of this disease as well. Um, of course, when we're looking at timely messaging and that's critical for emergency response workforce because if, if we're calling things like hotspots, we need to have that surge workforce back up, ready to go to get on those phones and to get out to, to our swabbing clinics and so forth. Um, capturing data and reports, I guess, you know, now, I think this is where, and this is obviously is not just a challenge and a plan for the Northern Territory, this would be worldwide, where we are now being able to start really doing a much more in-depth analysis of how COVID has impacted on communities. How have things gone for Melbourne who were in lockdown for 111 days, for example? What happened to their community? What, how did they socially, did they manage this? So we can actually start learning more now and making sure that we are reporting that, that we're disseminating that information so we can all keep learning from each other to make sure that if we need to have another big response to COVID, if we did per se have another peak, that we've got another really well-informed response and we've learned a lot from what we've done up to date. And so many more challenges and plans. <laughs> so I think um, I'll finish there. Um, thanks for, for listening. I hope that I've given you all a, a fairly sound overview of um, what we've been doing in the Northern Territory at this, this point. Um, and I'll, I'll just show you the photo that we've got here is, is from um, Department of Health photo. This is our AINs, our Assisted in Nurses program. Uh, this is a pilot program that we were running to help build capacity to our health workforce here in the NT. So these are all second and third year undergraduate nursing students um, who have come on and basically hit the front line of, of COVID with us. Um, to, uh, and they're all working out at the um, Howard Springs quarantine facility and, and also out in our point of entry team there. So thank you for listening. I'll hand over for um, any questions now. I just took a while. There we go. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much, Angela. That was really, really informative. And the first thing I'm going to do is to uh, hashtag ditch the office tea towel, <laughs> I think, because you don't think about that. And now no. I and have. it's not just for COVID. It's for anything, really, yeah. you know, any, any kind of ill disease and so forth. It's and just, we do yeah. have a paper towel dispenser in the kitchen. Absolutely. So I think we'll be directing people to that area. Um, we do have a couple of questions. So uh, one of them's come in. Um, 
and uh, they say, I'm concerned about drug reactions with the vaccine. I have a range of autoimmune disorders that are caused by prescribed drugs. I'm in a vulnerable group. Um, mm -hmm. I can't even have antibiotics. So I'm worried that this vaccine will put me in hospital again. Right. Well, that's, that's a great question. And I'll have to say straight away, I'm not, I don't have the expertise to actually advise you on that question. So what um, we felt for the um, vaccination rollout in our VAX team, we're actually following the national guidelines. So it's not a, a territory response, so to speak. It's a national response by the Commonwealth. Um, and that's outlining what vaccinations we use, who should get vaccinated and so forth. So in that national response, what they're advising for people like yourself who have these concerns is to get in contact with your local doctor and discuss with them what what would be best for you and they as well can then contact with our vax team so our vax team is here in um in the northern territory and basically help put you in contact with someone who'd be able to help you with that question so it is it is a valid question because we have seen that there's a lot of um those types of concerns going on in the background with the vaccine um and yeah and so it is that the recommendations are to follow up with your doctor before you would get that vaccination Excellent. Good advice. Uh, we also have someone who's asking, are there plans or preparation uh, to accept more international students for 2021? Well, I think you'd have to ask CDU that. <laughs> <laughs> um, at this point, look, I, I know that the, the international students that when they came through, it was, it was really great. Like it, it was basically a successful um, project in getting them through the quarantine facility. Um, it was quite a wonderful experience out at, at Howard Springs, having such a, a multicultural group come through um, because we, we had people from all over the world in that first international group of students. So it was, it was quite wonderful. And, and we did have a little giggle because I remember one of the students turned up in like almost like a full hazmat um, suit when they got off the plane <laughs> drive so <laughs> and I saw that on the news but we, we we're quite safe here in the territory so she would have probably he or she would have got very hot um no I think you know what that's that's probably a question that you'd have to put back to Charles Darwin University I'm certainly not aware of um any you know plans haven't fed down to me um, at this point but that doesn't mean that conversations might not have happened yeah so again sorry I, I can't really can't really answer that one <laughs> Okay, so we've got a twofold question here. Um, congratulations to you and the team for keeping NT so safe. Wondering mm -hmm. whether you see the Northern Territory playing an ongoing leadership role in the quarantine space going forward. Well, I definitely do think that that's going to be on the cards. Um, there has been a lot of um, international correspondence around the, you know, our quarantine response and the way that we've got our quarantine set up. Um, there's different aspects, I think, that, you know, that we've learned as COVID's gone along. So really, we can't be too critical of other states and territories in, you know, their quarantine setups, because we've got to understand that we're learning more about this disease as we progress. Um, and, you know, so I would like to say, yeah, that that we can certainly share a lot here in the Northern Territory as to what's worked for us. But I'm mindful of not being too critical of, of um, other places as well. Um, knowing that for us here in the NT, it's it's been quite a challenge within our um, quarantine facility too. It, the environmentally, our quarantine facility is all concrete and cement, and very it's all out in the open. So we have that advantage of small rooms which have their own air conditioning system, um, and we they can open doors and get fresh air. But for us as workers out there, it's incredibly challenging. So there's still parts of our quarantine area that, you know, are not ideal for us as workers, for example, particularly when it's pouring with rain, it's very hot, and we're having to walk through and, and do COVID swabs of people within a quarantine facility. But um, but to get back to the question, it's, yeah, absolutely. There's It's, it's well known that um, people have been tapping into Howard Springs quarantine facility teams um, and working with the Hazard Management Authority to, to basically, you know, talk about the different strategies that we've been using here in, in the NT. Uh, someone's come in and said, I've been at Howard Springs uh, and the services they provided were commendable. Where can I give my feedback for them? Okay. Um, 
the best like best place to get in contact is through the emergency response workforce uh, there's an email emergency response workforce dot doh at nt.gov.au and we could make sure any feedback did feed through for you and plus if you've got any other questions or wanted to get in contact with us about the emergency response workforce um, that would be the email to use as well great um, and we have are we in a position to increase our quarantine facilities capacity uh, in brackets number of people who could quarantine if not what are the major hurdles to it I was just saying before, the actual quarantine facility itself, if it was used its purpose as a workers' camp, it would take around 3,000 people. But we would have to be, we have to be fairly strategic. So as I was describing, you know, how we move people through the facility to sort of make sure that we're keeping people safe within there. So we're not putting people who just arrived next to someone who's been there nearly two weeks. Um, so yeah, it, it can take more people it's at a thousand people right now actually within that facility that's across both sections and it could absolutely increase quite safely but it's a real strategic approach to being able to you know increase that because we have to say everyone's in for two weeks so they can't just have everybody arriving at once um, to top it up you know you've got to plan when people arrive so you've got safe spaces to put people away from you know uh, you know, new arrivals away from longer stay people and so forth. Um, and that's what they've continually been doing within that facility. So it kind of rotates around the, the quarantine facility um, to, to make sure that, you know, we, we can continually bring people in um, and bring them in safely. Um, I'm not sure what our capacity would be. I'd have to consult with the How It Springs team on, on that to sort of know what, what they had said, the capacity um, that they would be comfortable with. Because, of course, the other thing we have to think about is the staffing, the resources, the feeding, and, of course, the rubbish. That environmentally, there's, there's a lot of wastage as well that needs to be managed around these types of zones. Um, all the PPE we're wearing, you can see in this image in front of you there, that's, you know, that all, everything that comes off there goes in the rubbish. Um, and, of course, all the meals, they're all on disposable plates and things. Um, so logistically, a lot of planning needs to go into to being able to increase. Mm. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll take the last question here, which... I would believe would become from someone in the demography area. Uh, so <laughs> it is, does the government have a policy around sharing data on migration of people across border, borders? So if you go on to the, the Northern Territory um, COVID site, there's actually a statistic page there that shows you how many people we've got coming into the Northern Territory. It doesn't go into the minute details of like who's coming you know how many from Adelaide and so forth of course we are keeping that that data there um, and you know if, if that was something that you needed to access you need to get in contact with the border restrictions team to ask them about that um, but yeah we that that information is like it's freely available up there same as you know at the moment we've done something like you know I think it was 120,000 swabs you know that type of information is all freely available on that nt government on the COVID site okay yeah all right well that was all the questions we had in the q a section so okay. i think we will close up now so thank you angela for presenting yeah. for us today and no, thanks um, so much for having thank me thank you and your team and everyone for keeping the territory safe i yes. think um even though we don't see it there's obviously a huge amount of work that goes in the background yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you for being part of that. And uh, if you want to contact Angela and team, we'll put some um, details up on the probably our social media pages so mm -hmm. people can right. get in contact if they've got some questions. And I think we will close it for the day. Thank you right. very much. Well, thanks again for having me and thank you to those who are listening in. And um, I said, I'm just a very small person in a very, very big process. <laughs> so, but, but there, it's a great team. So thanks again.